Heavenly Father, we are very thankful for your kindness, your faithfulness to us, and for making such a wonderful ways to find out, to share your love, your blessings, your compassion, your forgiveness with us, to help us understand your character and to invite us to fall in love with you. I pray that as we study together here, we will find more and more facets of your character, which will make it easier for us to understand and also for us to surrender ourselves completely and totally and constantly to you. May your Holy Spirit help us tonight to comprehend in Jesus' name. Amen. Memory verse time. Uh, although I would like to take a couple of seconds here before we start the memory verses to welcome those that will be watching the video on YouTube later on. We know that these videos have been watched in different parts of the world, and we would love for those that are watching to leave us a message. Tell us where you're watching us from. We are praying for you. God bless you. Memory verse number one, Matthew 1, 21. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Very good. Number two is 2 Peter 3.13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. The third one is Hebrews 9.28. So Christ was once, off, once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So there we have, he suffered once for many and for them that look for him, he shall appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Hebrews 9, 28. And it is time for me to share more with you so here, come, here comes the next memory verse, and you're going to fall in love with it. It is from Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. Philippians 3, verse 9. For those of you who have been in the class before, you remember Philippians 2, 5 through 8, right? Well, this is just a neighbor and just as beautiful. And it says, and be found in him. Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So that is the desire of our hearts to be found by him when he returns, not to be standing before him with all that we can show. I did this and I did that and I did the other and I gave this much and I put so many hours in this. Nope, that's not going to cut it, right? That does not cut it. That only puts us into a, a, a round of working and working and working only to fall flat on our faces every single time. But when we fall in love with Christ, then that response to him in faith, faith is that response of appreciation for what he has done for us. Then things are so easy. So easy. That is righteousness, right doing by faith, because it's faith which worketh by love, right? We will mention that later on, probably tonight yet. So again, the new memory verse is from Philippians 3, verse 9. Let's read it again together and be found in him. Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Righteousness means right doing. So we don't want to be found with our own right doing. That is all pride and it's as good as filthy rags, right? We want to be found doing the right works of God because we allow him to do them in us. Out of love for him, things are just so much easier because the love of Christ constrains us, right? 
And to constrain means to impulse, to propel. So when his love is propelling us, things go so much easier. It's, it is not a burden. It is a joy. All right. Then I think with that, we can go now to our study. And we are on page 37. We are starting chapter number six. The title of it is The Call of Abraham, Flesh Against the Spirit. It is an article that was written for the present truth of June 8, 11, <clears throat> 1896. It is based on Genesis 16, by and large. And we will be checking out with Genesis 16 a lot. Actually, as we begin, you'll find they are printed at the beginning of that chapter, Genesis 16, 1 and 2. If you want to read it out of there, it's fine. But if you have your Bibles handy, please open to Genesis 16 because we're going to read more than that. Actually, we're going to read 16, 1 to 13 to get the full flavor of what it is that is talking about. The, the chapter is going to develop a lot of points there. And if we have the story in our minds, I am praying that that will help us also to understand things much easier, to see the point of what it's talking about there. Now, we had left Abraham last time in chapter 15, when God came to him and the salutation was, I am your shield and your uh, exceeding great reward. And we said, Abraham barely acknowledged his greeting and he just went on to say, I still don't have a child. You have not given me any child yet. And all that I have is this servant here, this um, um, steward of my house. He will be my, my child, considered my child, and he will be the seed through which you, that you have promised me. And God said, oh, no, Abraham, no way. It is not going to be him. It will be someone coming from your own bowels. And he took him out under the stars and says, count them. And at that moment, Abraham believed what God was saying. And God counted it to him for righteousness. And then we went through the, the, the rest of the story in that chapter about the animals that were, were cut in two and put to the sides and a path in between. And by the time we got to, chap to chapter 15, verse 17, we found there God, the symbol of God passing through those that path, saying, in essence, so let it happen to me if I do not keep the promise I have made to Abraham. Condescending to sign a covenant that way. Not only that, but as a portrayal of what Jesus was going to go through. Because the cutting up of these animals very much represents the sundering, the renting of, renting of, their, of their hearts, of the oneness that the Godhead had had from eternity past. And at the cross, the cry of Jesus, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Very much gave, gave out the demonstration of how much this hurt, how much this was not just Jesus on the cross. The Father was suffering, so was the Holy Spirit, the whole Godhead. They gave the sacrifice. They made the sacrifice together, although it was only Jesus who was on the cross at that point. So now we pass on to chapter 16. We don't know how many years are there between chapter 12 and chapter 15 of Genesis. We know that in chapter 12, when God called Abraham out of his household, Abraham was 75 years old and his wife was 65. So 15, chapter 15 happened somewhere within the first 10 years that they were in, in the new place where they had gone to. By the time we get to chapter 16, he is 85 and his wife is 75. So with that in mind, we begin reading verse 1. Now, Sarai, 
Abraham's wife, bare him no children. And she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abraham, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abraham, Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarai. And Sarai, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abraham had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband, Abraham, to be his wife. Stop there for a second, and let's look a little bit closer to those first three verses. Sarah thinks now, maybe even basing we don't have any information on the Bible about this, but just remembering what we read in chapter 15, how God answered to Abraham, no, it's not going to be the steward in your house that's going to be your descendant. It's going to be one that comes from your bowels. Maybe Sarah thought, oh, God did tell him ten, uh, five, six, four years ago that it's going to be from his mouth. So if he is with somebody else that can have the child, Maybe that would work. Or maybe she did not even think about that, but she was thinking, when is this going to happen? I am not getting any younger. And if that baby is going to come, I'm going to have to have the baby. So how is that going to happen? And somehow out of the lack of faith, out of, out of the lack of understanding the character of God, she suggested that her husband takes her maid, maid servant for a wife. Now, if Sarah had been thinking of the character of God, knowing that God says thou shalt not commit adultery, because God is not an unfaithful God, she would have probably stopped to think, wait, it, wait, it, it is, doesn't make sense to try to do something for God while you are going against his character and giving him a black eye on his reputation. Anyway, she suggested to her husband that, that he does that. And you notice there in verse 2, Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, what? The Lord has restrained me from bearing. He is to blame. For the fact that I am barren. Doesn't that sound like when Adam and Eve sinned? And God came to talk to them afterwards. And the first thing out of Adam's mouth. That's in Genesis chapter 3 verse 12. The, woman, the man said, the woman who you gave me to be with me. She gave me of the tree and I ate. And when he, when God talked to the woman, she says, oh, the serpent gave it to me. And everybody passed the buck and it's always, always ends up with God. When we are not walking in the knowledge that we have surrendering to God, our excuses are always going to be aimed at God, at blaming him. Passing the responsibility, not realizing, not wanting to realize that we had made a choice. And we want to say, no, it is because you did. It's because you did not. It's because you took too long. It's because, 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 but it's you. She blamed God right there. And so she says, well, I have no choice. God didn't do what he needed to do. So I'm going to have to give him a hand. So that he will not come out to be a liar. See all of the things that are going on there? Just from the story, how many things you can see. How what we choose, how it damages and mars the character of God to the eyes of other people. And into our own minds, we become believers of what we are saying and choosing. Well, so she gave Hagar to Abram. And verse 4 now. And he went in unto Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. Uh-oh. Didn't 
<laughs> really, we're not surprised, right? We should not be. Because when we go against God, things will never come out right. Verse 5, And Sarai said unto Abraham, My wrong be upon thee. Oh, here we go again, right? Now she blames him. My, my wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judge between me and you. She even uses the name of God there to say, okay, God is going to have to do something about this. We messed it up. God is going to have to fix it. Verse six, but Abraham said unto Sarai, behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleases thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence camest thou? And whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress and submit thyself under her hands. Not an easy thing to recommend, right? Not an easy thing for, for him to say. He knows what has been happening. But isn't that another way? Here to, to see how God is so wonderful. He doesn't say, well, she is just some sinner who went in with the married man. And now she has been treating her mistress badly, being all uppity about it all. And, you know, she's just harvesting what she planted. No, God always comes after. And praise God, he does. And he doesn't say you are Abraham's wife, right? You notice there? He says, Sarai's maid. Yes. In this whole relationship here, and as, as there will be other chapters afterwards, you will notice that God never called Hagar Abraham's wife. He always referred to her as the handmaid of Sarai. In God's eyes, that relationship was not recognized as a marriage. It was outside of the marriage, and God could not go along with that, although he shows his mercy to the woman. Let's keep on reading. We are in Genesis chapter 16. Right now we are on um, number 9. We finished 9, actually. 10. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for, for multitude. Listen to all the wonderful news that he gives her now. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child and shall bear a son. Now that is like winning the, the lottery for a woman at that time. Here she is, a handmaid, but she's going to have a son. Wow. Not only is she pregnant, but she's going to have a son. That was such a wonderful thing to any woman at that time in that civilization. And shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard thy affliction. More good news. God is mindful of what is happening to you. You might be a servant. You might have even been sold because she's from Egypt so she's not from those parts there she would have been brought out probably stolen taken from her family however whatever the conditions she was here as a servant as a slave and he says God has seen your affliction God does not make a difference he has no favorites he loves us all we are his children. Number 12, and he will be a wild man, talking about the child that she will have. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And she, now hear the response. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. 
She responded right away. She didn't say, oh, no, I don't want anything to do with you. If you are, you have anything to do with Abraham and, and them, I don't want anything to do with you. No, she understood that this God loved her. This God might love Abraham, might love Sarah, might love all their family, but she was loved by him too. And she recognized that. What a wonderful way to respond. Thou God seest me. For she said, have I also here looked after him? That seeth me. As we have read there, there will be more commentary as we go along. But we see a God that finds every opportunity to show his love for us. And he, he's not stingy with his love. And he goes out of his way to show his love for us. Pursues us all the way to the end. So now back to the book and we will be in paragraph number two, page 37, chapter six, paragraph two. This was the great mistake of Abraham's life, but he learned a lesson from his mistake and it was recorded for the purpose of teaching that lesson to all. We will presume that the reader is acquainted with the sequel. How the Lord told Abraham that Ishmael, the son of Hagar, was not the heir that he had promised, but that Sarah, his wife, should bear him a son. And how Hagar and Ishmael were sent away after Isaac was born. We will study that later as well. So we may proceed at once to some of the important lessons that are suggested by this transaction. And that transaction then is talking about yeah, um, Sarai's idea to give her maid to her husband so that he could have, hopefully she thinks, the son of the promise. Third paragraph. In the first place, here is something to underline. We should learn the folly of man's trying to fulfill the promises of God. That is a lesson that Abraham learned in a very, very hard way. As a matter of fact, we're still carrying on the consequences of that hard way. There's the Middle East forever fighting and um, people dying. And if they're not fighting, they're planning for the next war and so forth. So we should learn the folly of man's trying to fulfill the promises of God. God had promised to Abraham an innumerable seed. When the promise was made, it was beyond all human possibility that Abraham should have a son by his wife. But he accepted the word of the Lord and his faith was counted to him for righteousness. Do you remember where you find those words? God counted it to him for righteousness. Genesis 15 verse 6, right? Yes, let's continue. This in itself was evidence that the seed was not to be an ordinary seed, but that it was to be a seed of faith. So we're not talking lineage by blood and genetics. We're talking here by faith. That is, There's going to be a big point about it in the next page. But his wife had not the faith that he had. Yet she thought that she had faith. And even Abraham doubtless thought that in carrying out her advice, he was working in harmony with the word of Lord of the Lord. Let me say here at this point, never ever think that going against God is carrying his will. It sounds like an, an oxymoron, right? But really, if we think of it, and and I say it because I've, I've seen it. I've seen it done so many times. I have heard people tell me that they are praying so that the Lord will guide them as to what to do when they already know that the Lord says, thou shall not do this or the other. But they are praying to see what the Lord is going to show them. No, this, there's no praying that's going to make any difference there. What are we trying to do? Have the Lord tell us, no, forget my word. I didn't mean that. Well, you got you have an exception. I, I allow you to do it this once. 
No, never, ever, ever. Let's continue. The mistake was in hearkening to the voice of his wife instead of to the Lord. Another one to underline there, right? Notice it doesn't stop after wife. It doesn't say that the mistake was in hearkening to the voice of his wife, period. No, it was in listening to her instead of listening to the Lord. You could put anybody there, not just the wife. When we listen to anybody in place of God, right there is a mistake. Right there is a big one, big mistake. They reasoned that God had promised them a large family, but that since it was impossible for her to have children, it was very evident that he intended that they should devise some other means of bringing it about. Thus it is that human reason deals with the promises of God. But the fact that they that the people deal in that way with the promises of God does not make it right. Okay, continuing now, yet how short-sighted the whole thing was. Underline here, please. God had made the promise, therefore he alone could fulfill it. I have a, a, a little different way of saying it, which but says the same. Only God can fulfill God's promises, right? Only God can fulfill God's promises. Continuing, if a man makes a premise, the thing promised may be performed by another person. But in that case, the one who made the promise fails to carry out his word. So even though that which the Lord had promised could have been assigned by the device which was adopted, the result would have been to shut the Lord out from fulfilling his word. Page 36. They were therefore working against God. We made that point already, but underline it there. They were therefore working against God while they were thinking they were doing what God wanted them to do. And they were actually doing God a favor. They were helping God out. They were actually gone, going, working against God. Continuing, but his promises cannot be performed by man. Another one to underline. God's promises cannot be performed by man. These points are so big. It's a, these are foundational in understanding, for example, the Ten Commandments. Those are also God's promises. Are we thinking we are going to be able to do them? No. If that's what we're thinking, don't even try. But are they important? Of course. But don't put don't put the cart in front of the horse. Horses were not made to push. Put the cart behind the horse and the cart will move. Will go in the right way. Let's not try to carry on God's promises because we will find we are pushing a Cadillac up a hill, which we cannot do. But back to the paragraph, in Christ alone can they be, be performed. It is easy enough for us to for, for us all to see this in the case before us. We sit here, we read the story, and you know we say, "Oh, how foolish! Why did they do that? What were they thinking? Let's think again, right? Yet how often? In our own experience, instead of waiting for the Lord to do what he has promised, we become tired of waiting and try to do it for him and thus make failures. How true. Let's go back to our memory verse. It fits right here. And be found in him. Philippians 3 9, that's the new one. Philippians 3 9, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness. Oh boy, did Abraham ever want it, I'm sure, many times to be able to go back and do that over, right? And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, 
but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God, the right doing which is of God, by faith, by believing him, by falling in love with him. Spiritual and literal. Years afterwards, the promise was fulfilled in God's own way. But it was not until both Abraham and his wife fully believed the Lord. And now it's going, it's going to be quoting here from Hebrews 11.11. 11. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful. Who had promised. After all of this. Thank God they did not become. You know because sometimes when people realize. That they have made a mistake. What they do is they just get. Hard headed about it. Hard hearted. Say no but I was right because. Thank God they didn't do that. They said, oh. No we should have waited longer. It did not matter how long they waited. It's gonna, gonna, it was going to be God. Is there anything impossible for God? No, it isn't. To God, it was the same to have had Sarai to have a child when she was in her 20s and 30s and 40s as it was for her to have a child at 90. Do we understand that? Then now let's pass it to our own circumstances. Is God facing an impossible with the situation that you are facing? No. You're not 90 yet. <laughs> Think of it that way, maybe. <laughs> Wait on the Lord. <laughs> he will come through. Continuing now, Isaac was the fruit of faith. And now it's going to go into Galatians, Galatians 4. So open your Bibles to Galatians. Have it ready. We'll read 22 and 23 here from the book, but we're going to read more than that. Galatians chapter 4. Um, let's read what is there. For it is written. Now, so, so this is now in the New Testament. It's giving us some more information as to this same story that we just read in, in um, Genesis 16. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise. Do we understand what that means now? Knowing the story should make it so much easier, right? Ishmael was bo born of Hagar. She was a slave. So he was not born from the promise. No. God had promised that the son was going to be uh, free. And so he could not be free if he had been born of, of a slave. But Isaac, the son of the promise, that one was spiritual. And we're going to come back to that in the next paragraph. But for now, let's go to Galatians chapter 4. I'm going to read some more of there. So many of the spiritual lessons that we need to understand about faith and about trust and about righteousness, and about covenants, and all of those things. Those, these are the, the foundations of that. The very story teaches us. It's, a, it's an illustration of the truths that God is trying to, to teach us in other sections. So, Galatians chapter 4. We're going to go to verses 29 to 31. And I'm sorry, we're going to begin with 28. Not, not 29, but 28. I wasn't reading that well. All right, 28 says, Now we, so this is talking about us. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of the promise. We are the children of the promise. Remember here, we said from the beginning, here the, being, being the seed of Abraham is not by flesh. It's not by genetics. It's not by blood we're talking about here. It's by faith. So we are children of the promise, just like Isaac. Isaac was the promised child. 29. But as then, 
he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. Even so, it is now. Human beings who do not believe in God, who are not of faith, they will forever persecute those that believe in God. Not only now, it has happened like that all throughout history. It happened in the case of Ishmael and Isaac. It happened in the case of Cain and Abel. Cain did not believe God, decided to take his own way. And what did he end up doing? Killing his brother, who was doing what God wanted him to do, was responding by faith. Verse 30, nevertheless, what says the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. And now we'll keep on going into chapter 5. We're going to read chapter 5, verse 1 and verse 6. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty. We were born of the free woman, right? So stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And be not entangled with the yoke of bondage. Verse 6. For in Christ Jesus... Neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but what? Faith which worketh by love. What makes a human being part of the descendants of Abraham? Faith. Faith that works by love. When we are in love with God, when we find out how much he loves us and we respond in appreciation for his love, then anything and everything that we do is because we want to please him. And it makes us so glad to be able to please him that we want to do more and more and more to please him. You know what it is to be to be in love? I'm sure I'm talking here to adults who have been through that and who are in love still. Don't come to me on the on the sidewalk with a list and ask me if I want to marry you so that I can do your laundry and your cooking and take care of your children. <laughs> Are you crazy? Oh, but charm me. Tell me that you love me. Show me that you love me. And what do I end up doing? Your laundry, your cooking taking care of your children, and then finding every occasion to show you how much I love you too. It's the same with God. Same with God. It mentioned there about the one persecuting the other. I want to take you quickly to um, Genesis 21. Genesis 21. After Isaac. The son of the promise had been born. Um, verses 8 and 9. The child grew talking about Isaac. And I'll give you a little chance to get there. And I didn't give this to Janet. Sorry. As the spirit moves here. Genesis 21, 8 and 9. And the child Isaac grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham, mocking. And as a result, that she had Hagar and her son, who was already about 15, uh, no, probably about 17 years of age. At that time, she had them leave. It says there, Actually, in verse 10, the very words that we read in Galatians. Wherefore, she said to Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. That tells us, let's cast out that bondage. We don't want to be in bondage. Let's continue now. In the book. The second paragraph under spiritual and literal. And have your pen and, pens and pencils ready because there's going to be plenty to underline. Many people overlook this fact. 
they forget that Abraham had two sons, one by a bondwoman and the other by a free woman. One born after the flesh and the other born after the spirit. Hence the confusion with respect to the literal and spiritual seed of Abraham. See, we, we hear literal and so we think, oh, okay, those that were literally his sons. They were born to Abraham. They were their sons because they had the same genes, same DNA. No. When the Bible talks about literal, it's the same as spiritual. Spiritual seed of Abraham. People talk as though the word spiritual was opposed to literal. No. But this is not the case. Spiritual is opposed to fleshly or carnal. That is what is the opposite of spiritual, not literal. Literal and spiritual are the same. As a matter of fact, literal is equals to spiritual is equals to real. And here comes the reasons for that. It'll help us understand more. Isaac was born of the spirit, yet he was a real and literal child as much as Ishmael, Ishmael was. So the true seed of Abraham are only those who are spiritual. But that does not make, it, make them any less real. God is a spirit, yet he's a real God. Christ had a spiritual body after his resurrection, yet he was a real, literal being and could be handled the same as all the bodies. As a matter of fact, Jesus came in among the disciples and they were all spooked out. And he says, hey, it's me. Touch me. Feel me. Do you have anything for me to eat? And they gave him some fish and some honeycomb. So being spiritual doesn't mean being unreal. Not at all. So the bodies of the saints after the resurrection will be spiritual, just like Jesus after the resurrection. Yet they will be real. Spiritual things are not imaginary things. Indeed, that which is spiritual is more real than that which is fleshly. Because only that which is spiritual will endure forever. I was hoping to have gone to the end of the chapter, but as long as we are learning, it doesn't matter, right? I would like to share with you in closing, if you open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, because it goes to this very paragraph that we just finished. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. <clears throat> Beautiful closing for this. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to begin with verse 6. We're going to go 6 to 9. And it's up on the chat already too. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 6 to 9. Talking about real, being the same as spiritual, being equal to literal. Okay? For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. God has given us all that truth, all that light, but we are just made out of clay, right? Earthen vessels. Why? For what reason? That the excellency of the Power may be of God and not of us. Because what happens when you have something made out of clay and you just barely give it a little tap and falls? It breaks right away. Oh, but look at what happens when the power of God is in this little clay vessel. Eight, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. And now, if you don't mind going to verses 16 through 18 at the end of the chapter. For which cause, 
we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. They are real, they are spiritual, they are eternal. Amen. How about we bow before this great God who has given us so much light out of darkness? And let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God of Abraham and Jacob and Isaac, how wonderful that you are also our God, a God of promises that are kept because you are faithful, a God that is spirit but is real, and a God that finds every opportunity and every method to reveal himself to us, to help us understand what is in your mind, what are your thoughts, so that we can surrender our lives to you and be able to allow you to do in us that work of preparation so that we might live with an eternal, holy God. Thank you for being so caring, so detailed, so loving. Thank you for watching over every one of us. And you watch over the person that might feel very free, as well as over the person that might feel very much unprotected. Thank you, Lord, that under your wings, Every one of us is secure. Grant us, Lord, that we will not seek for any reason to get out of your hold. Thank you also for the promises that one day we will be able to be in your presence. We believe, Lord. Help our unbelief. In Jesus' name we pray.